we're here because the problem is dramatic and it's gotten worse. The problem of bias towards Asian Americans and Pacific Islander Americans. And we've seen it explode in, in horrific violence, uh, some of it recorded on camera, but much of it not. And we have statistics that demonstrate a big explosion in reported cases. But we also know the vast majority of hate incidents go unreported. They don't get on the radar screens of law enforcement. In 2017, the last year that the FBI compiled data in this way, 87% of law enforcement agencies reported no hate crimes of any sort in their jurisdictions. Now, you and I know that that's highly unlikely. And so that speaks to the underreporting problem. This is not an abstract topic. People's lives, people's safety is literally at risk. And we know that the threat has risen. And so we're here today to reach out to those who have been attacked, uh, either through language or physical violence, and to their family and friends, and to let those folks, as well as anyone who might feel anxious or vulnerable, you aren't alone. You aren't alone. Members of our community are concerned about your well being and concerned about the bias that's driving this. We have to tell those who abuse others that this is just not a, a acceptable. We will not, as a society, tolerate it. There is no excuse for it. But we have to do more than you know, offer empathy and outrage. We need to what? We need to explore this bias that yields the ab abuse. We need to go at the thinking that people of Asian ancestry aren't and can't be Americans, that they somehow don't belong. And we have to speak to this problem. We need to make sure that we reach out and that we include. We have to also ask why America's relationships with other places can spill over into how we treat each other, how you know, uh, issues that the United States may have with China are sometimes driving what's happening towards Asian Americans in our country. We have to get beyond diversity as a slogan, diversity as the name of an office. We have to embrace diversity as a strength. We have to make it real. A lot of organizations have been holding webinars and many people, especially here in Southern California, gathered on the weekend for rallies to protest Asian American hate. Our gathering is going to be similar in some respects to those, but it's also going to be different. We begin today with one of California's great representatives, Congressman Ted Leo, who uh, represents one of the Southern California districts in Congress. We also have a distinguished group of scholars from across the United States and across campus. We have two U USC professors, Jane Jun from political science and Lon Kurishige from the history department. From the University of Colorado at Boulder, we have Jennifer Ho. And from uh, Atlanta, from the Carter Center, we have Professor Yahweh Leo. All of them are going to be speaking with us today. When they finish, then we'll get to your questions. But you can submit those questions at any time. So please don't, don't hesitate to start doing so from the very outset. Our first speaker is the distinguished Congressman Ted Leo. Uh, each of you has read his capsule biography uh, as part of the event announcement. So you know that he has served the United States and the American people in many different capacities. He served the United States in an Air Force uniform. He's been a clerk for a federal judge. He's been an elected representative in Torrance uh, here in Southern California. He's served in state government and represents his congressional district 
in Washington, DC. He is a distinguished leader in many areas, and one of the most important ones is in battling climate change, but he is also an important leader with the Asian Pacific American Caucus. Congressman Leo, please get us started. Thank you so much, Clay, for your leadership and that wonderful introduction. And I want to thank the USC, US China Institute for putting on this important program. And I'm honored to be on with this distinguished panel. And as Clay has mentioned, there has been an unfortunate surge in hate crimes against Asian Americans. Uh, this, however, is not surprising. If you look at our nation's history, unfortunately, when America feels fear. Uh, at times, it will scapegoat minorities. And so in the 1850s, we had the whole yellow peril hysteria uh, that was then followed by one of the largest mass lynchings uh, in US history against uh, a number of Chinese immigrants. And then we had the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, we then had the internment of over 120,000 Americans who happened to be of Japanese descent during World War II. And then 1980s, when America feared the rise of Japan, you had additional hate crimes committed, including against Vincent Chen, who was murdered because they thought he was taking away jobs. And then now with this pandemic, you have another surge in hate crimes and hate incidents against Asian Americans. A part of this happens uh, because of something called the foreigner syndrome, when people uh, look at me or other Asian Americans, sometimes their first thought is that we're not American, uh, that we're not loyal to this country, that we're second class citizens. And you see uh, this uh, play out uh, in different aspects of life, as well as um, in very bad acts by our own government. So for example, uh, the entire reason for the Japanese internment was the inability uh, of our government to separate the actions of a foreign government with Americans who happen to be of Asian descent. And you're seeing that during this pandemic where you have people who unfortunately uh, do not separate the actions of a foreign government, in this case, uh, namely China, who uh, did suppress the virus and mislead the world about the virus uh, at the beginning. Um, versus Americans who happen to be of Asian descent that have nothing to do with that. And it also shows that rhetoric does matter. Unfortunately, uh, last year you had the former president of the United States use racist phrases like Kung flu, um, and that simply added fuel to the fire. And there has been studies that show, in fact, there were increases in hate incidents against Asian Americans because of the language uh, that was used by the former president. And it is, again, this inability uh, for our government and some people in America to make this separation uh, between foreign governments and Americans of Asian descent that causes part of this problem. You also see it, for example, uh, at the State Department. If you look at uh, this issue known as assignment restrictions, what you'll see is that uh, a disproportionate number of people who get assignment restrictions, uh, which they can't work in certain countries, happen to be Asian Americans. And it does appear to me at least that if you're an Asian American uh, in uh, sensitive positions in our government, that you're held to a higher standard, uh, that somehow you're viewed with more suspicion, uh, that somehow you might uh, have dual loyalties. Uh, other ethnic groups have encountered this as well. Jewish Americans, for example, I've also been uh, the victim of uh, this view of possible dual loyalties. And it's simply an issue that we have to speak up and speak out and fight against. And also to just educate uh, government officials and policymakers uh, that this is an issue and we need to fight back against it. Uh, something else we need to do in terms of hate crimes specifically is one reason that you don't see the federal hate crimes law uh, being used as uh, often as it should be, is because the courts have interpreted it really narrowly. Uh, the Sixth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals, for example, basically said that you can only charge uh, federal hate crimes uh, law if the sole reason uh, for the defendant's uh, crime was because of race. That's a pretty high bar uh, to meet. And so I'm working on legislation uh, that would uh, change that and make it um, easier to charge or hate crime. And then we have to devote additional resources uh, 
to investigations and prosecutions of hate crimes, as well as encourage people to report hate incidents as well. Uh, so thank you again for having me on this panel. Look forward to answering any questions uh, that you may have and really appreciate your focus on this important issue. Congressman Leo, thank you for that opening presentation that really gets at some key issues, including uh, the discrimination within the government at the State Department in terms of not making some positions available to people who are quite qualified for them and might represent the country uh, quite well. So thank you for that. We're going now to move to Professor Jennifer Ho. And after all of the speakers have had a moment, uh, you know, in the spotlight, as it were, uh, to share their thoughts, we will then have a discussion involving all of them. So please, a couple of people have already posted questions. Please continue to do that. Uh, Professor Ho is the current president of the Asian American Studies Association. She's a distinguished scholar. She's produced a number of monographs and essential teaching collections. Uh, one of the things that I read that she wrote uh, more than, I guess, a dozen years ago was when she was a relatively new professor at the University of North Carolina, writing about being an Asian American in the South and talking about that sort of experience. You've probably heard her on NPR. You may have read her essay, uh, her recent essay on CNN, but I would also encourage you to go to the PBS website and to watch the film First Vote. Uh, she is one of the people featured in that film, which looks at engaging Asian Americans and especially Chinese Americans in the political process in North Carolina. Jennifer, take it away. Hi, thank you very much for being here. I wanna begin with a land acknowledgement because I am coming to you from Lafayette, Colorado, which is the traditional territories of the Cheyenne, Arapaho and Ute nations. And I begin with a land acknowledgement because I think if we are going to talk about power structures and we should be talking about power structures if we're talking about the rise of anti-Asian racism, then we have to acknowledge the complexities of race and racism in the United States and to understand that the foundations of the United States are settler colonialists. So that means that even if I as an Asian American, Chinese American, daughter of a refugee father from China, immigrant mother from Jamaica, whose parents themselves were immigrants from Hong Kong, right? We may not have been responsible for the U.S. conquest of these lands, and yet I benefit from that settler colonialism. And I think it's important that we acknowledge our history. And so this is part of U.S. history, just as the exploitation of Asians in America is part of U.S. history. And so to understand the rise of anti-Asian racism happening now, we have to understand that the roots of that are white supremacy, which began against Asian, specifically Chinese immigrants in the 19th century. We also have to acknowledge the way that race and racism plays out among various non-white people in the United States. It is day four of the Derek Chauvin trial where he has been accused of killing George Floyd. Now, I think that many people who saw those eight minutes of footage would have no doubt that Derek Chauvin played a hand in George Floyd's death. What is also complicating everything is the ways in which Black Americans in this country are not given automatic humanity. That's one of the reasons that there's a movement called Black Lives Matter. Because so often throughout US history, Black Americans have not been given automatic humanity. And I wanna talk about Black Americans, especially now, because there have been viral videos that have been occurring over the last few months showing black people harming and in some cases killing Asians, especially Asian elders. And so when I do workshops and answer questions by the media, one of the things that comes up time and again is this question of the majority of these hate crimes happening at the hands of Black Americans. And what I continue to tell people is that that's simply not true. It is not true that Black Americans are perpetrating the majority of the racist incidents against Asians. Um, there's a report that's soon coming out of University of Michigan. They're working with AAPI hate 
They were interviewed by um, NPR's Code Switch. And based on very rough data that they went through, um, looking through media reports, looking through people who turned in incidents reports to the AAPI hate data website, what they discovered is that roughly 90% of the anti-Asian racism incidents are happening by white people against Asians. And only 5% are by black people against Asians. And I really think this is important. It's important for us to disrupt the narrative of black aggression, particularly black male brutality, because that's already a pervasive and damaging stereotype that is out there. There is a reason why the viral videos of black people harming Asians has gotten much more traction than videos and images of white people harming Asians when white people harming Asians has been happening since Asians first arrived in the United States. So the idea that Asian Americans are being targeted during COVID-19 is absolutely true. 150% spike in anti-Asian racism. But the concept of Asians being harmed is not new. It has been around since the 19th century. And we can see it in all the, the instances that um, Representative Liu just shared with us. Um, I'm gonna share some resources in the chat. I also wanna address one of the questions that's already come up, which is thinking beyond the carceral in terms of how to address this rise of anti-Asian violence. So there's been a lot of discussion about whether what happened in Atlanta was a hate crime and lots of discussions about trying to um, bring that shooter to justice. What seems clear to me whether or not he's actually tried as harming specifically Asians, right? Is that he, in his own words, targeted women. And we should really think about that. We should think about the fact that why isn't it being charged as a hate crime against women? I clearly believe that he targeted these women because they were Asian. I don't know whether I need him to be prosecuted and incarcerated for a hate crime in order for me to feel like justice is done. I think the concept of justice for me is going to be an end to racism in the United States, an end to white supremacy, an end to intersectional oppression. And the way that I know how to get us there is through education. Thank you. Professor Ho, thank you so much. Our next speaker is Professor Lon Kurashige who is from the University of Southern California, has done extensive research on Asian American history. One of Professor Kurashige's great books is called Two Faces of Exclusion. And it's a wonderful book. I would encourage you to read it because it talks about exclusion as obviously an expression of bias, uh, imposing legal discrimination, all of those sorts of things. But one of the important parts of that book is talking about the pushback, the pushback on the part of Asians in America against such discrimination, but also the pushback by other Americans. It was always more complicated than we sometimes, sometimes think. He's done work on the 1920 election, anti immigration legislation in California, that sort of thing. Take advantage of that book. He's also the co-editor of a couple valuable teaching collections, Understanding uh, or uh, Major Problems in Asian American History, and a new textbook called Global Americans, looking at where Americans are from, what they've contributed, and where Americans have gone. It's a terrific resource. Professor Kurashige couldn't actually be here with us today because he's in another web space uh, teaching his class. So we recorded this presentation for you now. Thank you, Clay, and uh, for having me here today and for offering um, a historical perspective on the unprecedented events going on today about or uh, these days of the anti-Asian hatred and hate crimes and violence and so forth. Um, you know, the obvious historical perspective is this isn't new, right? And I think you don't have to be a historian to know this, although that's a whole nother question out there because so many people think this is new. They think this has never happened before. And it's the same 
people who think that Asian Americans are somehow all immigrants who've just come to the country in the last 10, 20 years, 30 years. Um, so there's a long history, right, of, of Asians in the United States, of Asian Americans, um, going back to at least the mid 19th century, if not earlier, with the arrival, mid 19th century arrival of, of migrations of Chinese immigrants to the West Coast, to, to Hawaii, et cetera. And that history has been continuous. Chinese, then Japanese, and Koreans, and South Asians, and then uh, more, and then Filipinos as well. And then, you know, after World War II, uh, many, many other groups. And so you have the, the situation where there's a strong presence of Asian Americans, especially in places like Los Angeles, but all around the country, right? So the fact that there are Asian Americans is not new. And because Asians have been in this country for a long time, anti-Asian hate, unfortunately, has been in this country for a long time. And that shouldn't surprise anyone, given the sort of white supremacist and anti-minority, you know, minority, whether it's Blacks or Native Americans or Latinos or whomever, um, you know, violence and hatred and, and, and legislation, you know, that has been um, more the norm than the exception throughout American history. So it really is just like with the civil rights movement for African-Americans, it's really only since the 60s, right? That you have the end of at least formal anti-Asian racism, you know, in, in policy, in laws, in, in statutes, et cetera, and in executive orders, like the executive order that sent 120,000 Japanese Americans to concentration camps during World War II. So those types of policies are only fairly recently abolished. And so there's always been a relationship between the hate crimes that have been rampant. And I, you know, I, I don't know if I have the time to go into a lot of them, but I'm sure your other guests can, can, can talk about them and, and you can read about them, massacres of Chinese workers in the US, um, violence against Japanese after Pearl Harbor, and then even up more towards the, the present where after 9-11, where you have you know, South Asians, you have Sikhs with turbans getting shot at and killed as vengeance for you know, the, the attacks on the, the Twin Towers and, and the Pentagon, et cetera, right? So the idea of scapegoats, you know, whether it's Jews during the Holocaust or African-Americans and all of the, the kind of urban riots and, and, and you know, in, in, in the urban North against Blacks. I mean, the idea of scapegoats for some broader international or social problem or fear, you know, is not new. Um, and it shouldn't surprise anyone that Asians have been the victims. Um, but that's, that's the curious thing for me is like why people don't know about the history of Asians in the US. And so that's maybe the larger question about not just how anti-Asian hate crimes are not new, but how people don't know about the history of Asian Americans. And, and there's a popular stereotype and a, and a very pernicious stereotype that the result or the consequence of that history is that they think um, Asians aren't Americans. Right, somehow that, that we don't have a history, that if you have a history, somehow that roots you more in this country, it gives you more legitimacy somehow uh, in America. Um, so that idea of being forever foreign and thus not being American, you know, is perhaps the deeper problem underneath all of these hate crimes. Because there's always going to be, I don't want to, you know, validate in any ways the the hate crimes going on and all of the problems. Um, but there's always gonna be scapegoats. There's always gonna be some off balance, crazy people out there during times of stress. In this case, international stress, you know, involving China, right? Um, in which crazy people are gonna act, right? So you're always gonna have that kind of scapegoating. And what's different today and, and perhaps I think hopeful, more hopeful, is that the government is not condoning this. The government is not, you know, contributing to this in terms of adding, in terms of anti-Asian policies or, or, or orders. Of course, with the exception being Trump. I don't want to say everything's perfect and, and there's no problems, but the hate crimes, you know, that's a continuity that that 
unfortunately is going to be there because of the, the nature of scapegoating and the nature of white supremacy and racism, which persists in this country. Uh, thank you, Professor Purashige. It's both uh, sad that this seems new to people. And that's a failure, of course, of our educational system and something that the people uh, who are speaking today are all part of trying to address. Uh, in some states, it's mandated to teach about the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's mandated to teach about internment. But in many places, this is not part of the story. And the contributions that Asians uh, in America have made over the long sweep of US history have also been downplayed, neglected entirely. So this is important. And our next speaker, Professor Jane Jun uh, from the Department of Political Science at, at USC, she's done, in addition to her other work, she's done some work on the impact of civic education on the involvement, the mindset of young people. And so she has some ideas uh, about that working, but her field of expertise is political participation. She's written a number of books on this subject, including a couple key ones for our discussion today, The Politics of Belonging, Race, Immigration, and Public Opinion, as well as another book on Asian American political participation. Professor Jun, please take it away. Great, thank you, Clay, and thank you to everyone uh, for attending. I'm gonna be brief, and I'd like to just make three points. Um, I'm sure you all didn't attend this to get lectured at by university professors, but I, so therefore what I wanna do is give you three things to think about and hopefully that we can uh, continue on with our discussion. And they do relate to political participation. And the reason that I'm talking about them is as I've read through the questions, some of the questions in the chat, they're all great questions. And many of them are focused on how it is that we combat prejudice against Asian Americans. There are many ways to do that but I wanna focus for the moment on participation and the role that ordinary Americans, that's all of us, should be playing in this process. And so by that, I mean on the ground mechanisms of democracy and that's voting and things beyond that. So I just wanna raise three points for your consideration. The first is the state of Asian American political representation in the United States. So to some degree, when we think about representation we think about how it is not only just as a function of the types of attitudes and issues that people represent, but also in what form, in what person, in what body is there. I think it's quite important to see the members of Congress, this includes uh, Representative Liu, who was an impeachment manager most recently on the second impeachment of Donald Trump. But in addition to that, many of our other members of Congress, not only from California, this is including you know, Ami Berra and uh, Ro Khanna in the North, and then Judy Chu, my member of Congress, but also two women who are the only Asian Americans in the Senate, Tammy Duckworth and Maisie Hirono. So on the one hand, what we view now is an increasing visibility of Asian Americans on the national political scene. But at the same time, I wanna emphasize that the proportion of members of Congress, and let's just talk about the federal Congress here, because I imagine some of you are coming to this from outside of California. There are only two senators, that's only 2%, and there are only 15 members of Congress who are Asian Americans, that's only 3%. The, the number or the proportion of Asian Americans in the US population is double that, you know, two or three times that. In other words, that there's almost 6% of the American population that's Asian American and much more heavily so in states like California, Hawaii, Texas, Washington, et cetera. So the first thing I'd like us to think about and maybe just roll this over in your head, like what does it mean to be represented as an Asian American? It's not an, a question that has an actual answer to, but I think what's important about it is not only the visibility that these current members of Congress and other political leaders show for us, but it's also celebrities, athletes, who are representing the Asian American experience and our perspectives on this issue. The second thing I want to raise is for us to think a little bit about Asian American political participation. And many times elected officials or scholars or really political commentators will say, well, you know, Asian Americans are not really very uh, 
interested or active in politics. I would like to say for the record, that is just simply not true. Asian Americans do lag other groups of Americans, so whites, African Americans in particular, in terms of turnout, registration to vote. But much of that is a function of, or the explanation for that, is the fact that Asian Americans are relatively new population. As Professor Kurashige noted, Asian Americans have come to the United States really only after 1965. And more than two thirds of adult Asian Americans in the United States today are naturalized citizens. So you have to imagine the amount of time it takes to become uh, a naturalized citizen and then register to vote and then go on. So while there are some gaps between Asian Americans and other Americans in terms of their voter turnout, Asian Americans will eventually catch up and will catch up quickly as a function not only of their importance in politics or to politics, but because relatively speaking, high levels of education, which always drives for every group, for every person, uh, more participation and activism in politics. The last thing I'll say about that is democracy is not just about voting, it's about everything that all of us do, whether that's going to meetings, going to school board meetings, um, giving donations, working in community-based organizations. These are all activities that contribute to the health of American democracy. In the absence of, of that activity, we will become more sick than we already are. I think the last thing I wanna note is about the role of parties, other institutions, community-based groups, organizations in mobilizing the Asian American community. Someone mentioned faith communities in the chat. I think this is very important for us to consider the ways in which even when something terrible and events like that happened recently in Atlanta and others, they provide a terrible reason for us to be mobilized, but at the same time, they provide also a sounding board and a place to begin. I just wanna end then by highlighting to your attention if you are a Democrat, maybe you're not, but if you're a Democrat, you might have enjoyed the outcome of the race for the two Senate seats in Georgia. I would like you to note just how important Asian American voters were in turning out to support Democrats in that election. And in this case, bringing the Senate to 50-50. And so that of course is a, a key demonstration of the power of mobilized people. Uh, the role that people can play in the political process. And that's something that we can continue to address. Also, one of the things that uh, you know, was highlighted here is the role of the naturalization process. Unlike people who are just happen to be born uh, within the boundaries of the United States and its territories and become citizens that way, people who are naturalized citizens have to prove themselves, have to earn their way in. They have to study and demonstrate uh, to the satisfaction of an immigration official that they know US history. They know something about the constitution, these sorts of things. Now, a couple of people have already highlighted education and that's come up as well in the Q&A section. We can talk a little bit more about that. Now, uh, Congressman Ted Leo is an immigrant himself. Uh, as a child, he came from Taiwan to the United States. Our next speaker came as an adult from China to the United States. Uh, when he was a young man in China, uh, the policy there towards the United States switched dramatically. Uh, he remembers hearing uh, you know, uh, uh, speakers announcing uh, Mao Zedong's statements about American imperialism and the need to combat it wherever you find it, that sort of thing. And then President Nixon was visiting. And before long, President Carter established diplomatic relations with China. Professor Yahweh Liu now works for the Carter Center in Atlanta. He has lived between the two countries and we're honored to have him with us today. He's a specialist in how Americans and Chinese see each other and the relationship between the two countries. Yahweh, take it away. Thanks, uh, Clay, for the uh, invitation. And uh, I have four uh, observations, uh, some of which are already covered by the previous speakers. The first one is uh, 
anti-Asian racism is deeply rooted in America. I think Congress, Congressman Liu uh, talked about that uh, very well, you know, the lynching of the Chinese uh, in 1850s, you know, the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, in 1882, uh, then the Japanese internment in 1942, and then he also talked about the brutal murder of Vincent Chin uh, in 1982. He also talked about President Trump, you know, laboring uh, COVID as Chinese virus, you know, what uh, was not referred to uh, is the China initiative at the Justice Department. You know, if uh, we, we, we have all read the White House uh, facts sheet on how the administration is going to address uh, this uh, rising hate and crime against uh, Asian Americans. But one of the things, you know, one of the government agency that President Biden uh, is enabling uh, to, to return justice you know, to Asian Americans uh, has failed uh, to, to mention this uh, initiative with, with a huge uh, racist undertone, which is the China initiative. Now, the second point I want to make, uh, I think uh, Congressman and others have also mentioned that is economic and the political circumstances escalate uh, anti-Asian racism into open hatred and even uh, violence. You know, when Vincent Cheng was brutally murdered, beaten to death with a baseball bat, you know, he was uh, perceived to be a Japanese American. American government and the media outlet, you know, back in the 80s, uh, blame uh, the Japanese economic aggression against the U.S. Uh, it's the Japanese that caused unemployment, particularly uh, in Detroit, uh, the motor city. You know, that's why uh, Vincent Cheng uh, was was beaten to death in, in such a brutal way. Uh, what's even worse is uh, uh, he was only given a three year suspended sentence. And then others you know, took him to the federal court and he was tried and convicted uh, on violating Vincent Chen's uh, human rights, the Ebens, the murderer uh, of Vincent e. But even that conviction later on was overturned uh, by a federal court. So today, you know, China uh, is playing the role that Japan used to play. China is the culprit. Uh, both the Trump administration and the Biden administration describes a China as a huge threat to the national security of the United States, as well as the welfare of the American people. So in this context, ethnic Chinese become agents of the communist conglomerate, but at the same time, uh, they're targets uh, of hate targets of increasing and growing violence against them. Uh, the, my third point, I think Jennifer Ho uh, also referred uh, to that is Asian American uh, AAPI community is really a mixed group. You know, some of them are labeled as a model minority, uh, which is oftentimes used by the dominant race, you know, to ridicule and even to suppress other minorities. You know, the second point uh, about this mixed group is oftentimes, Je as Jennifer said, you know, violence targeting Asian Americans is perpetrated by Black Americans. And this could be used by other to destroy minority unity. You know, we're all working together to pursue justice and fairness and, and equality. Also, I think Asian Americans, and in my case, Chinese Americans, you know, we have our own problem on issues of racism. We do stereotype other ethnic minorities. And Asian Americans also stereotype each other. I just want to give you a, a case, uh, an example uh, that happened today. Uh, Sari Kim, a Korean American, who is running for a house seat in Texas, made the following remarks. I don't want Chinese Americans to be here at all. They steal our intellectual property. They give us coronavirus. They don't hold themselves accountable. Frankly, I quoting her, I can say that because I'm Korean American. You know, and the audience, if you watch the YouTube video, the audience just laugh and they think that, you know, that's a very uh, accurate uh, comment. You know, that that's a sad and unfortunate re reflection uh, of what is going on here, but also their divisions among Asian Americans. Finally, I want to talk about uh, Tan Xiaojie, 
her English name is uh, Emily Tan. You know, the massage parlor owner who came from uh, Nanjing, you know, south southwestern part of China. What I want to say is her life tells us two things. Number one, the fact that she came here, the fact that she was able to succeed in her business shows to all of us that the United States is still the most friendly and open country to immigrants. You know, if you give immigrants in search of a better life, in search of freedom, a choice of which country they would like to go to, I, I think most of them probably prefer to come to the United States. And that, that's a fact. And as Clay mentioned, you know, I came from China. I came here with $200. The fact that I'm able uh, to be relatively successful working uh, for former president uh, Jimmy Carter, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful to the opportunities given uh, by, by this country. And, and this country continues to offer this kind of opportunities to all immigrants, including Asian Americans and particularly Chinese Americans. But what is, her life tells us second is, you know, this is again, a country filled with discrimination, hatred and unnecessary uh, violence. And, you know, she was brutally uh, shot to death here at the place you know, she's, she's a good mom, she's a good boss, she's a good neighbor, she's a good friend. And, and the way she, her life was cut short, you know, two days short of her 50th birthday shows that, you know, there's a long way to go uh, to make this country better. And, you know, we are survivors and as survivors, all Asian Americans, all colored people need to work together to make this place a, a better place so that not only we can work as hard as Emily Tan, not only uh, can we succeed in what we are doing, uh, but also to live long enough to enjoy the success uh, and also to make this place better and safer for our children and children's children. So I want to end uh, my initial remarks by quoting uh, Gary Locke, you know, uh, governor former governor of, of Washington state and uh, American ambassador to China. He made the following remarks at the rally uh, on March the 20th after the brutal killing uh, of uh, eight people here in Atlanta on March the 16th. So this is what Gary Locke said. When someone says to us, go back to where you came from, I will respond loudly, except for the Indians, we're all immigrants. Whether you come from Europe on the Mayflower or the slave ship from Africa or from Asia to build railway, railways, you know, this place is my hometown, America. Thanks. Professor Leo, thank you so much for remembering the sacrifices, the actual, the actual work that so many, so many have given and then to have their lives extinguished so brutally. And we have two people uh, who are part of the panel today, who you know live and work at the site at the sites of recent mass killings, and we've had mass killings here in Southern California of late as well. I want to invite all of the speakers to come back, uh, to turn your cameras on, and to come back. And I would like to begin with one of the one of the questions that has come up in. The Q&A. And so members of the audience, please continue to submit your questions via the Q&A. Uh, but also it's where uh, Congressman Leo began. It's where several other people, inc including Professor Leo, traveled with us in their comments. And that's this question of foreignness. What does it take to be an American? What does acceptance require? And you know, we, we focus on this and then we move on from it so readily. And the question of belonging, the question of inclusion, where are we? What do we need to do? Let's begin with Congressman Leo. Uh, that's a great question. I certainly think that having representation matters and not just in government, but everywhere. Uh, so during this pandemic, for example, um, my wife and I did happen to watch a variety of different series on, on Netflix and Amazon Prime. 
Uh, so one of the series we liked was a Designated Survivor. It was about government, but also it just happened that there was a kick-ass FBI agent who happened to be a female Asian American. And uh, we like also uh, the series Veep. And in there, there was a character who played a conservative Christian governor of a Midwestern state who happened to be Asian American. Uh, so I think if you have uh, the American public see Asian Americans in different settings and different walks of life, including government, uh, that uh, makes it better for everyone and something that we're trying to fight for uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, we do actually meet with various media companies and encourage more diversity, um, not just for Asian Americans, but for all minorities. And then having government officials uh, who look more like the people they represent also has a more resilient uh, government. And my last point is, all of you may have seen uh, that Senator Tammy Duckworth uh, essentially said that, look, to Biden administration, you got to do a better job in terms of uh, having a diverse slate of Asian Americans being nominated, and she threatened to not vote uh, for any more nominees, and then that caused the White House to create an entire new position uh, dealing with Asian American affairs. Now, is it possible an Irish American member of the Senate would have done that? It's certainly possible, uh, but it didn't happen. It did take an Asian American senator to get royally pissed off, uh, and so representation uh, also results in different policy actions as well. Yeah, and let me continue on that for just a second and maybe bring Jane in, uh, Professor Jun in on it as well. Why is it so important to put people in these places? Uh, you, uh, Congressman Leo, you mentioned representation in the media. That's something that we've focused a lot uh, on at USC, uh, both women, different, my, different ethnic groups, that sort of thing. But why is it so important to have someone who has the lived experience of being an Asian American in these positions of responsibility? Well, I think that these are standard to the descriptive representation claims that in order to understand what it feels like to receive the scrutiny, the extra scrutiny as a person who differs from what uh, many Americans would say a regular American is. So what does it mean to be a regular American or a regular kid? That basically means that you're a white person. And so when we think about what do, does it mean to be an American? I mean, political scientists have been asking people these questions for many years. Do you have to be white to be American? Do you have to be Christian to be a real American? Must you be, must you be born in the United States? And over time, the numbers of people, the numbers of Americans that agree with those characteristics that you have to be white and Christian and born in the US has decreased over time. But it remains the case that white Americans in particular are likely to say, you know, large proportions of them, probably similar to about what the base in the Republican Party is at present, agree that you have to be white to be a, a true American, you have to be a Christian, you have to be born in the US. And so there's, there remains a significant, if not majority, proportion of white Americans in particular who still think to Asian Americans are hyphenated Americans. Someone in the chat wrote, why can't we just teach about all of American history instead of calling it, you know, Asian American history is American history. I think that's a point well taken. Um, I also just wanna make, uh, respond to something that the representative said, which is really true. An Irish American wouldn't need to do that today, right? If Tammy Duckworth was Tammy O'Neill, she wouldn't have to do, she wouldn't be there if this was a hundred years ago, because a hundred years ago there weren't, uh, very many women, certainly not women in the Senate. But 100 years ago, there was anti-Irish discrimination in the United States. It may have been necessary 100 years ago in the same way it might have been necessary for Mario Cuomo's ancestors were they in the United States. Today, we face a different issue. I think the distinction between categories of white, even if they were considered less than white, remain nevertheless phenotypically understood by ordinary people as being of the white race, whereas Asians have always been the forever foreigner. So as optimistic as I think we can be about changes over time, I think it's also pretty difficult. And as we've noted from the other panelists to move away from the longstanding, very deep history of the racialization of American citizenship. It is embedded in the constitution. It's embedded in our history. It's part of the DNA of this nation. It is 
precisely why we need to be active politically to alter it, actively to alter it, not just to wait until it goes away because it won't go away without us. Yeah, time certainly is not a, a way to solve this problem. Uh, action is required. And so, uh, you know, most of the people in Congressman Leo's district are not themselves of Asian ancestry, but he is their representative. My representative is an African-American woman. And so they are all Americans and they can represent us uh, in this way. And so getting beyond the idea that a regular American is a white male like me is a, clearly a challenge. Uh, we have polls that suggest two thirds of people of Asian ancestry have been asked, where are you from? have been asked questions, half of them have been asked, do you speak English? You know, these sorts of things. And so the default understanding is the challenge. And so I wanted to ask Congressman Leo, uh, we, you've already said some, something about this. And Professor Leo, would you like to talk about this question of belonging? So thank you uh, for raising that issue. Uh, I happen to, I have grown up, um, in a neighborhood where it just happened that um, everyone uh, was not Asian. And the school I went to, um, I was only Chinese American. Uh, in fact, most people were white. Uh, and it wasn't really until high school that I even had an African-American student uh, in the high school. So um, my experience growing up was I was made to feel uh, that I did not belong. Um, nothing ever, ever violent happened to me, but people call me chink. Uh, they would, you know, sometimes throw eggs at our house. Uh, one day our tires were slashed. Uh, so it's sort of these, you know, microaggressions uh, over time. And it was just very clear they didn't think of me as part of the community. Uh, that changed when I went to college and I thought, oh, it's really quite different. Uh, and um, it is something I think a lot of Asian American kids grow up with that the notion that they somehow don't belong. Now that is changing. And one reason it's changing is you do see more representation uh, in uh, government, in the media and in leadership positions, but also just a sheer population growth is pretty astounding. Uh, since 2000, the number of Asian American eligible voters has more than doubled. Uh, you have right now more immigrants from Asia to the United States than any other region in the world. And the Pew Research report uh, shows that uh, they project by 2055, Asian Americans will be the largest immigrant group in America. And so I think while time doesn't cure things, time plus population growth uh, will actually, I believe, make things better. Well, and the population growth also yields greater contact, greater engagement, those kinds of things. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Professor Leo, did you want to speak to that? You've recently written an article entitled, uh, I'm Proud to be an American. Thanks, uh, Clay. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, as Professor Jun mentioned, you know, a normal, regular American uh, might be a wasp. And, you know, if that's the case, then we are never going to belong to that. Uh, a lot of the not belonging uh, to America, I, I think, particularly for first generation immigrant uh, like me, is is self created. That you know, we like to congregate together. You know, we like to talk about Taiwan. We like to talk about Chinese politics and American politics. But I think in the last four years, you know, not only the population is growing, as uh, mentioned uh, by Congressman Liu but also the politics of the United States in the last four years is such that we, particularly the Chinese American group, we were forced uh, to mobilize and you know, into political activism. And we played a very important role uh, as Professor Jun mentioned, you know, had it not been for Asian American votes, uh, I don't think President Biden is gonna win Georgia. Had it not been for mobilization of Asian American votes, you know, Senator Raphael Warnock and Senator uh, Joseph Ossoff, you know, the first African-American senator, first Jewish senator from Georgia, they're, they're not going to happen. I, I think this process that we're participating in the political process and we're making a difference uh, 
has created a, a new sense of, of belonging. We belong here. We are Americans. And, and I think you know, this, this is a leap. And I was asked the question yesterday is whether this is going to continue. I, I think uh, this, this is going to continue. It, it will be sustained for many, many years to come. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we're trying to get Professor Ho back with us. I'm um, not quite sure what, what happened on that front, but I wanted to pick up on something that Professor Leo mentioned in his earlier comments. In his earlier comments, he noted that one branch of the US government, the Department of Justice, has something called the China Initiative. The China Initiative is something that we've devoted a lot of time and energy to at the US China Institute. And at our website, you can see links to some of the interviews that we've had with both people charged with carrying it out and people who are critical of it. I would encourage you to take a look at that. But that is an important question. And we have Congressman Leo, who is uh, you know, uh, trained as an attorney, a member of the Judiciary uh, Committee, those sorts of things. How worried should we be that labeling something as the China initiative in the Department of Justice leads quite quickly, easily, to racial profiling, to discriminatory enforcement, that rather than looking for uh, whatever sort of economic espionage you might find, you start by looking at people of Chinese ancestry in academia and in business. And so since uh, Professor Leo, since you brought that up, I was wondering if you might say a little bit more about it and the role of things like that in perpetuating the question of foreignness, belonging. Yeah, I, I, I would say China Initiative is probably like a modern day Chinese Exclusion Act. You know, that's what it does. And if you listen, to FBI Director Ray, Christopher Ray, you know, in his uh, open remarks. And recently one professor uh, from MIT, Gong Chen, uh, was charged, uh, the local field director of FBI, basically saying the same thing, is every 10 hours, we open a case against the ethnic Chinese for either stealing uh, intellectual property or uh, engaged in uh, commercial espionage, you know, every 10 hours uh, from two years ago, you know, how, how many ethnic Chinese or Chinese American researchers, you know, from NIH or other research institutions supported by NIH and National Science Foundation and being charged, you know, how many of them were convicted? You know, we, we want to know these things. Uh, Professor uh, Maggie Lewis of Seton Hall University wrote a long paper uh, about you know, she didn't say this is malpractice, but this is, as Clay, you mentioned, it is racial profiling. It is uh, perpetrating uh, this uh, uh, stereotype that uh, Chinese Americans uh, have divided loyalty and, and they, they are every one of them. You know, I think Congressman also mentioned at the State Department, you know, I also heard other people say uh, ethnic Chinese, Chinese Americans, it's very difficult for them uh, to pass security clearance, largely because, you know, they are Chinese American, they cannot be uh, trusted. And, and that's serious. Uh, while I applaud President Biden and the administration, all the effort, you know, coming down here to Atlanta to talk to AI, AAPI leaders, you know, the Congress uh, administration doing so many things and asking the you know, Justice Department doing all the things, I, I do urge, you know, both uh, Congress and the administration to look at the China Initiative. We need to know more. And I, I think this, you know, it's legitimate to catch all the spies, but then to, to label a task force uh, as being Chinese or perpetrated by the Chinese Americans, that's just wrong. That's, that is not uh, appropriate. And, and particularly at this time uh, of, of tragedy and growing violence against Asian Americans. Thank you. Uh, Congressman, would you care to comment on the China Initiative, how it's being implemented? Sure. Uh, in the last term of the Obama administration, I remember uh, when I read an article about how Sherry Chen, a federal employee, had been arrested by FBI agents accused of espionage type crimes. 
and then um, uh, essentially many months later, all charges were dropped. So I started to write a letter to the Department of Justice, um, basically asking what happened. Before I could finish that letter, I read another article, this time about Professor Xi, uh, who was arrested by FBI agents, also charged with espionage type crimes. And then his case, uh, several months later, well, also all charges were dropped. And as we looked into this, there were about four or five cases like this where the only thing that was the same uh, were that defendants were charged with espionage type cases, then the charges were later dropped, and those defendants all happened uh, to look like me. Uh, they happened to be Asian American. And so I worked with other members of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus. We did press conferences, wrote op-eds. We um, also called in members of administration. And we got the Department of Justice uh, to do two things. Uh, they added another layer of review in the Washington DC office for these kinds of cases so that a US attorney couldn't just go ahead and charge these things without a second layer review. And um, then uh, the then Attorney General at the time ordered implicit bias training for all personnel at the Department of Justice. And to us, that was a recognition that they understood something was happening where uh, either prosecutors or investigators were holding Asian Americans or higher level of suspicion. And so they uh, ordered that uh, training. I don't believe the Trump administration ever executed that training. So I'm in the process now of writing a letter to Attorney General uh, Merrick Garland asking him to uh, institute the training uh, that then Attorney General Loretta Lynch uh, had ordered. Yeah, uh, we definitely need that kind of training. Uh, we had an interview with Assistant Attorney General John Demers, and we asked about the kinds of skills, the kinds of uh, competencies that he was trying to recruit for uh, in his job of defending national security. And language training and these sorts of things, cultural sensitivity, not part of that agenda. Rather, there was a focus on technical skills and this sort of thing. So definitely the need, and we've been fortunate to have Professor Shi as a guest to speak about his experiences and the continued, uh, the continued trends. If we could shift a little bit here, uh, one of the people in the Q&A makes the point that in fact, uh, Asian Americans are overrepresented in the US military. Uh, that in fact, in terms of putting on a uniform and defending the, the rights and interests of all, Asian Americans are out in front, out in front ahead of their numbers in population would suggest. I'd like to bring in Jennifer, uh, uh, Professor, Professor Jun to talk about the question of service, the question of that kind of engagement. You highlighted getting involved in the school board and things like that. Are we seeing a pipeline of Asian American, Pacific Islander American, uh, people who are serving in their local communities who might continue to rise, serve at the county level, serve at the state level, even at the national level? I think we are. I think that's a very good point. I'm not sure that, uh, I don't know what the research says systematically about military service, but in many ways for national office, military service uh, particularly for men, is considered a desirable, if not a necessary condition uh, to demonstrate loyalty and patriotism, and particularly so for Asian Americans. But Asian Americans are involved in all kinds of politics at the community level. So it's not just um, school boards, it's, you know, community organizations, it's town councils, it's um, state legislatures as well. And I think that what you are going to see is an explosion of Asian American elected officials in the next 20 years that, that follows the population dynamics as well. So Representative Lou's district is not an Asian American majority district. I believe it's only about 14% Asian American. It's just got everybody in it like most districts in the state of California do. And it's often the case, it's one of the most interesting examples or rather facts about US politics is Asian Americans are really the only non-white candidates who are able to be elected either statewide or in districts that are not majority minority. And make what you will of that, but most of the time, if in other districts, let's say that are represented by African Americans or Latinx 
members of Congress, or for that matter, in state governments. People, um, I'll just give you the example of Bobby Jindal and um, the South Carolina gov governor, Nikki Haley. These are two Asian Americans, in addition to Gary Locke, who are elected at the state level, despite not having even very large Asian American populations. And so I think the, the line of opening for Asian American elected officials is great. Not only, it's not, I'm not saying that there isn't discrimination from voters, but voters think about Asian American candidates in a different way than they do about African American and Latinx candidates. And by that, I mean white voters think about Asian Americans in a different way. So I do think that in many ways, local politics is a training ground for what you're going to see further up the line. And the presence of Asian Americans in all of these elected offices and just as well as town councils and appointed positions is important to, to show everybody that Asian Americans belong in the mix. Uh, so through the magic of that old technology called the telephone, we have uh, Professor Ho back with us. Thank you, Professor Jun, for that, talking about you know, the pipeline, talking about participation, uh, and you know what is what is happening? And we lost Professor Ho when we were talking about foreignness, when we were talking about belonging. And uh, Professor Ho, I don't know if you'd like to address that or add other comments. I think that representation is, of course, important, but it's not everything. And the reason I bring up that it's not everything is that, um, first of all, I I said yes to this event largely because I was thrilled that Representative Blue was here. I've been following his Twitter account. I believe that he is a voice for justice and for the Asian American Pacific Islander community. I don't know if I would feel the same way if Elaine Chow had been invited. In other words, Elaine Chow being part of the cabinet under the former administration did not make me feel safe as either a Chinese American or an Asian American. Her politics are not my politics. So the fact that we have an Asian American representative in, in the White House didn't actually translate into anything as far as um, stopping racism against Asian Americans, or in fact, having the president at the time contribute to that atmosphere of racism against Asian Americans. And so while, um, of course, I want more and better representation of Asian Americans um, in politics, I want the right kind of Asian American politician that actually cares about ending racism. Thank you, Professor Ho, for- you know, Professor yeah. Ho, I just want to add something. Um, you know, when the former president started using racist phrases like Kung Flu, I actually tried to contact Secretary Chow um, and she ignored me. Uh, so just want to put it out there. I, I, I bet you did, and I'm not surprised that she ignored you. Yeah, the <laughs> uh, Secretary Chow, of course, found that loyalty was, uh, was one way. Uh, once she left the cabinet, uh, and then after her husband criticized the president, uh, the president issued some statements about her Chinese business dealings and things like that. So loyalty definitely went one way. Well, we have reached uh, close to the conclusion of our program, but I wanted to allow each of our panelists a chance to raise any concerns that haven't been addressed. Now, we can't in 75 minutes begin to talk about all of these different issues. And in the Q&A, some people have raised questions very, very specific about uh, incidences and also giving examples of how a, a, a Chinese boy, when he was uh, called Chinese, he said, no, I'm from New Jersey. And so, you know, made those kinds of, those kinds of statements. But I'd like to invite each of you to offer some parting words, as it were. And so, uh, Jennifer, since you've struggled uh, so hard to be back with us, why don't you get us started? Uh, just, just a minute or so. Absolutely. So I know that some people put in the chat, you know, questioning whether education is really going to solve racism. Um, I think we need education to solve racism. I don't know that education is the only thing, but certainly if we don't know about um, Asia, our history, Asian American history, and how that's interconnected to the histories of other people, um, then we won't know how to start. The, the other thing that I'll say is that all of us can choose to be anti-racism educators. It doesn't matter what your identity is. It's really a matter of just choosing that you wanna fight against racism. <laughs> 
Now, thank you for that. We all have an obligation. We are in this together. Uh, you know, the negative actions, uh, you know, hamper us all. Prejudice is a disability and it weakens our society. Uh, Jane, would you go next? Uh, Professor Jun, please. Yeah, sure. I think that if there, if I would, you know, just want to say something about partisanship. I mean, most Asian Americans who are voters vote Democratic. And yet there, there are still, uh, you know, a substantial proportion, probably a third, who support Republicans now and then. And that is just the nature of our community. And our community, as someone mentioned earlier, is a very diverse community. We're not uniformly, um, as African Americans are, mostly behind the Democratic Party. I think it provides an opportunity for political mobilization. And it also requires us to listen to uh, all of our elected officials, as well as our um, fellow voters. I just want to end by, by asking you to think about the young people, though. So the young people who are Asian American, highly educated, for the most part born in the United States, heavily, heavily democratic and progressive. That's where the future is for Asian American politics. Uh, demography is destiny. Uh, so one of the thing, one of the examples we have in Southern California is a Korean American who serves in Congress, uh, Young Kim, who is a Republican. And so Republicans nominated her, Republicans supported her. And so it's not exclusively a Democrat Republican issue. And that's something that comes out in the documentary film that I want to encourage people to see again, first vote that uh, Professor Ho is part of. You see Chinese Americans for Trump as part of that discussion. Uh, but in fact, let's go to Atlanta where uh, Professor Leo has explained the key role about that Asian Americans played in moving the Senate in the democratic direction. Yeah, my uh, departing words would be, you know, as U.S. and Chinese rivalry uh, becomes more fierce, you know, our loyalty are going to be questioned uh, more and more. You know, as Chinese immigrants who voluntarily decided, you know, we're going to be Americans, so our loyalty should not be divided at all. There is only one country that we're loyal to, and that is the United States. And that's going to lead uh, to, to belonging, that's going to lead to political activism. But at the same time, you know, we don't want to see the two relationship get into a zero sum rivalry or maybe even escalating to com conflict. Uh, so I always like to refer to our group as a special interest group that would, we would like to have the two countries peacefully coexist. So we should not be afraid of pointing out to the government that uh, there are better ways to manage this relationship so it doesn't have to go into conflict. Thank you, Professor Liu, uh, who again focuses on U.S.-China relations, U.S.-China perceptions. Congressman Liu, why don't you be our concluding speaker? Well, let me thank again the USC U.S.-China Institute for putting on this wonderful event and Clay for doing such an excellent job of moderating. I thought I'd just leave with some words of hope. The Vice President of the United States is Black and Asian American. For the first time, you had a president of the United States in a primetime speech talk about the Asian American community. And then the president and vice president of the United States went to Georgia and met with Asian American leaders. You have an executive order from the president of the United States uh, on uh, fighting uh, racism and hate against the Asian American community. So you do have um, some things that probably 50 years ago you would not have seen. Uh, in addition, now what we do see is this amazing growth in the population uh, of Asian Americans. And then last few weeks, you saw rallies across America in support of the Asian American community. Uh, they weren't massive, but they weren't small either. And you had a number of non-Asian Americans turn out in support of the Asian American community. So all of this is good. And I think you're starting to see the political awakening of the Asian American community and also more recognition by non-Asian Americans uh, of the growing numbers uh, and influence of the Asian American community. Uh, so with that, thanks so much again for having me on and I look forward to working with all of you as we make America a more perfect union. Thank you. That's a great task for all of us and you've given us 
uh, cause for optimism. Thank you all for speaking, sharing your expertise, sharing your experiences with us. We wanna say thank you to the audience uh, for joining us. And what we want to do is also to deputize you, to ask you to help spread these messages. When we post the video for this event, uh, we'll send out a link and you can share that with friends, with family, with colleagues, and others who would benefit from being part of this discussion. It's been a great honor to have our distinguished speakers with us. And I want to thank uh, the folks across USC who helped to spread the word about the event, but especially the team at the USC US China Institute, uh, Craig Steubing, Catherine Gao, Venus Jones, and others who have made this possible. But now it's down to all of us. We all have a role to play. We all have a stake in addressing bias and the abuse that it generates. Thank you all for being with us.